appreciate you all being here tonight. And the rest of you, grab your Bibles, please, and open them to Matthew chapter number 25. Matthew uh, chapter number 25. And uh, we'll be using, oh, probably about a dozen places in the Scripture uh, this evening. Matthew chapter number 25 is where we're going to uh, begin. Matthew chapter 25. All righty. Matthew chapter 25. Y'all still glad to be here tonight? All right, look down at verse number. Thank you, those of you who are watching online. And again, if you are watching online, please just put a comment, simple comment. Amen, hi, we're here, I'm here, uh, whatever you'd like. I just enjoy um, all those that do get to watch online. All right, I'll look down at verse number, yes, sir? Matthew 25, Matthew chapter 25. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 31, Matthew chapter 25. 25 and verse number 31 it says this when the son of man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations and he shall separate them one from another as a shepherd divideth his sheep from the goats and he shall set the sheep on his right hand but the goats on the left then shall the king say unto them on his right hand, Come, ye blessed of my father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. For I was hungered, and ye gave me meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me in. Naked, and ye clothed me. I was sick, and ye visited me. I was in prison, and ye came unto me. Then shall the righteous answer him, saying, Lord, when saw we thee and hungered, and fed thee, or thirsty, and gave thee drink? When saw we thee a stranger and took thee in, or naked and clothed thee? Or when saw we thee sick or in prison and came unto thee? And the king shall answer and say unto them, Verily I say unto you, Inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. Then shall he say also unto them on the left hand, Depart from me, ye cursed into everlasting fire. Prepared for the devil and his angels. For I was in hunger, and ye gave me no meat. I was thirsty, and ye gave me no drink. I was a stranger, and ye took me not in. Naked, and ye clothed me not. Sick and in prison, and ye visited me not. Then shall they also answer him, saying, Lord, when shall, uh, saw we thee in hunger, and a thirst, or a stranger, or naked, or sick, or in prison, and did not minister unto thee? Then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, and as much as ye have did it not to one of the least of these, you did it not to me. And these shall go away into everlasting punishment, but the righteous into life eternal. All right, I want to speak to you this evening on this subject. You have done it unto Jesus. You have done it unto Jesus. Let's have a word of prayer. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening. Lord, I sure do love you, and I'm so grateful for all the people that came to church tonight. Thank you, Lord, for those who are watching online. And Lord, I just pray you bless us in a great way. I pray, Holy Spirit of God, that you'll please give me your power. I pray, dear Lord, for the mind of Christ. Help me to say only that which you once said. And then I pray for every person here and every person watching online that you'll give them ears to hear, heart to receive, and a mind to comprehend. Lord, touch every heart, change every life. If anybody under the sound of my voice, needs to get saved. Lord, help them to get saved tonight. And then, Father, I pray, Lord, for those, uh, for our country, those who are sick. Lord, help them to get well. Please uh, protect us from, from the illness and the coronavirus and help us uh, just to, just to get over this, this uh, pandemic or whatever it's called, you know. Lord, I pray for wisdom for our president, for President Trump and Vice President Pence. I pray, dear Lord, that they would receive wisdom from you and they would lead our nation in the right direction. I pray for our governor uh, of the state of Colorado. Lord, please touch his heart. Help him, Lord, to want to receive wisdom from you and not from other sources. And I pray, Lord, that Colorado will, will, will get back to work and be open and free again as far as uh, socializing and being able to go out in public. And I just pray, Lord, that you'll give our nation wisdom and guidance as we make, make decisions going forward. And then I pray for revival to sweep our land. Oh, God, give us a spiritual awakening. Help us to turn to you. Those across this nation, I pray that 
thousands upon thousands of people will get saved and millions of people will get saved. And then I pray for those that need to get right with you, Lord, that they would. And help us to see a spiritual awakening like we've not seen in this generation. And we'll give you all the glory for it. Lord, bless our service tonight. We'll give you glory for what takes place in Jesus' name. Amen. What we just read, if you look at Matthew chapter 25 and verse number, uh, let's see here, verse number, uh, verse number 31, it says, When the Son of Man shall come in his glory and all the holy angels with him, then shall he sit upon the throne of his glory and before him shall be gathered all nations. All right, so there are three judgments that are, that are in the future that are going to take place that have not taken place yet. And this is the order in, in which they will take place. The first judgment that's going to take place is what we call the judgment seat of Christ. And that's for all of us who are saved. So when the rapture takes place for the seven years of the wrath of God being on planet earth, the seven years that we'll be up there, because we're going to be raptured before it takes place, we are not, the Bible says we are not appointed under wrath. So we're going to escape it. The very next thing that's going to take place on God's timetable is the rapture. And then when the rapture takes place, we'll be up, up, up with the Lord in the clouds. There'll be two things that take place during those seven years. One is the marriage supper of the Lamb, and the second is the judgment seat of Christ. One by one, we will stand before Jesus and be judged, not for our sins, but for our life and for our works. And at that moment, God's going to give out rewards. Jesus will. He'll give out crowns. And then he'll give out positions to serve in his kingdom when he rules and reigns on this earth for a thousand years. And so basically, uh, what's, what's going to happen for your heaven and for mine is that this life is basically preparing for that life to come, the eternal life, and specifically the kingdom of God, the kingdom of heaven. And so you'll get rewards or you'll lose rewards based on how you live. And it's a very serious thing, I promise you. When, when, when you stand before the judgment seat of Christ, you don't just want to get a t-shirt from him that says, at least I'm here. You don't want that t-shirt. At least I'm in heaven, at least I'm here. Didn't earn anything, didn't do anything for God, uh, didn't live for him, I could have had a chance. No, you don't want that t-shirt, that, I promise you, you don't. And so, but that's the first judgment that's gonna take place. Then, after the seven years of the wrath of God, Jesus is gonna come back to earth for the second time and what he's going to do is he's going to set up his kingdom he's going to rule and reign on the earth for a thousand years now there's this is called the judgment of nations so what's going to happen is when the antichrist was was going to be on the scene for those seven years every nation on the planet is either going to aid the people of god the 144,000 jews that are evangelists and those people that got saved and wouldn't take the mark of the beast, they're going to aid them and help them and hide them from the Antichrist, or they're going to betray the people of God and turn them into the Antichrist, and those are the Christians that will be uh, martyred during that seven-year period of time. So when Jesus comes back, he's going to have what's called the judgment of the nations. We just read that. He's going to take the sheep, the nations that he calls sheep on his right hand, and the nations he calls goats on his left hand. And the, and the ones on his right hand, the sheep that were kind to the people of God, when, when the Antichrist wanted to kill them, then those nations are gonna be allowed to go into the kingdom age for the thousand year reign of Christ. All the other nations that were on the side of the Antichrist and betrayed the people of God, they're gonna get just go straight into hell. They're just, they're not going to go into the kingdom age. They'll just go straight into hell. So this is the second judgment in the future that we just read about. The third judgment is after the thousand year reign of Christ, what the Bible calls in Revelation chapter 20, the great white throne judgment. And that judgment will be where God judges all the unsaved people that are in hell. They'll stand before the Lord one by one at the great white throne judgment and then, then uh, be, be cast into the lake of fire, and their degree of eternal damnation will be based upon the sins they've committed in this life. And so the three judgments that will take place um, are going to be the, the first is the judgment seat of Christ, the second is the judgment of nations, and the third is the great white throne judgment. Now, 
this evening, we read the passage in the Bible that talks about the judgment of nations. Now, I want to I take a principle from what Jesus is going to do to judge these, these nations and apply it to our lives today during the coronavirus issue. I want to talk to you this evening about this thought, you have done it unto Jesus. If you look at verse 40, it says this, and the king shall answer and say unto them, he's judging the nations, so he's speaking to the nations that are on his right hand. Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye have done it unto one of the least of these my brethren, ye have done it unto me. And then the nations on the left, in verse number 45, Jesus says, then shall he answer them, saying, Verily I say unto you, inasmuch as ye did it not to one of the least of these you did it not to me. So there's a principle here that God has given us in his word. Basically, it's how we treat others, those specifically others that are God's people. How we treat others is exactly how we are treating Jesus. When you do it unto them, you're doing it unto Jesus. When you don't do it unto them, you're not doing it unto Jesus. We cannot, listen to this thought, we cannot do things for God without doing something for others. You know, you wanna, you wanna give to God's work. You wanna invest in the kingdom of God. This is where it takes place, the, 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 the local New Testament church. Um, if you give alms to people, um, there, there are several types of giving that are mentioned in the Bible. There's tithing. That's 10%, that's God's, it's not yours. And you don't ever give a tithe. You, you actually um, obey God and allow, you know, just allow him to do with it what the Bible says it belongs to him. So it's not like you're giving of your own money, your, your simple obedience when it comes to tithing, 10% right off the top. Then offerings is what you do give. And you can give offerings, doesn't matter how much, it could be a penny, could be a million dollars. I mean, it, it just doesn't matter. It's an offering. It's from, it's your money, your 90% of which to do with what you want. Then there's uh, sacrificial offerings, or sometimes it's called give-it-alls, where, where people just give all they have. And that's what, the, um, that's what the widow lady, she gave all her living. So that's where the phrase give-it-all comes from. Sacrificial offering comes from like in the book of uh, Acts, when, when Ananias and Sapphira and the other people, they sold property and they were supposed to give the entire sell of the property that they sold to the Lord's work. And uh, of course, Ananias and Sapphira did not give it all like they said they would and God killed them, but other people did. And that's called a sacrificial giving. That's not a give it all, but it's something of a sacrifice where you, you give like that. Then there's, then there's alms giving. And alms giving is when you see someone that's poor and you just simply go up to them and give to them. You don't sound the trumpet. Dun, 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 dun. Hey everybody, look at me. I'm about ready to buy food for a homeless person. Uh, God says, don't do that. If you do that, you got your reward. You ain't getting nothing from me. But almsgiving is supposed to be done in private. And by the way, or secretly, um, that's the only part of giving that is supposed to be secret. It's, it's fine, it's appropriate, and it's right to fill out an offering envelope, to write your name and, and, de and put your tithe and, and offering and missions money and whatever and designate it um, or write a check. I mean, that's completely fine. Every once in a while people say, you know, people have the misguided idea. Nobody's supposed to know what I give. Usually when people say that, 99 times out of 100, when all they do is put cash in the offering plate, they're not a tither. 99 times out of 100, and they don't want anybody, you know, to know, or they don't want to be convicted by it. They don't want a letter from the church saying this is what your giving record is for the year, um, all of that stuff. I mean, 99 times out of 100, it's really because they don't believe in tithing, and they don't want anybody to, to convict them about it or make them feel bad about it. But the fact of the matter is the only part of giving that's supposed to be private is almsgiving, and that's just when you give directly to a poor person, someone in need. But God says, that's how you give to Jesus. When you give to a missionary, you're giving to Jesus. When you give to a poor person, you're giving to Jesus. As you have done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. The flip side is as you've not done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've not done it unto me. And so we cannot do things for God 
without doing something for others. How you treat others, now watch this, especially fellow believers, is very important to God. You look, you can't get over this. Every once in a while, people hate other church members or they hate Christians. Man, God's going to make you have a mansion next to that person for the rest of eternity if you don't change your attitude. And it's going to be your own stinking fault, too. I'm serious now. Don't you be hating on God's people. You know why? Because if you hate on God's people, you're hating on Jesus. This, hey, listen to me now. This is Bible. You hate God's people. You are hating Jesus. You love God's people. You are loving Jesus. During this coronavirus time in America, it's very important that we learn to treat people like we would Jesus. And I think it'll make this whole situation go so much better. Man, there's so many people out there in society, especially those who are not believers, of course, that are just so hateful. I, by the way, I went down to the rally in Denver on a Sunday afternoon. It was so, it was so odd how, what God did. We had an adult visitor from Loveland who came to church at the 930 service. First time he's ever been to our church. And the reason he came is his church up in Loveland is not having in, you know, in-person services like we are. And so he says, I want to go to church. And he found out about us, and so he came. And he had a good time, enjoyed himself. Afterwards, he, he, he talked to um, me and my wife and some other folks in the lobby before he left and had a good time. Well, I went down to the rally in Denver about you know, uh, opening up Colorado again and uh, doing it now, you know. And uh, so I'm down there at about, I got there at 2 30 and I stayed till 3 30 and uh, the event started at 1 and ended at 4 but I you know had church and stuff and I had uh, went home and I got 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 a big old American flag and some Trump you know uh, uh, signs and stuff uh, for Benjamin and and so I, I did all of that and I got down there about 3 30 maybe about 3 40 you know or 2, 2 40 I'm there and all of a sudden that guy walked up and said hey fancy seeing you here it was the visitor that came to church here at 9 30 on Sunday morning and uh, he didn't tell me he was going down there and I didn't tell him I was going down there um, but but we happened to go down there and so um, but during this time there are people that are just so angry. I mean, there literally are people that said to the protesters, I hope you get COVID-19. I hope you die. If you get the virus from that rally, we're not going to treat you in the hospital. You're not going to, you're going to kill Americans. You're, I mean, just all this anger and vitriol just all over our country right now. It should never come from those of us who are believers in God. We should never live that way. We should be better than that. We should look at every person, how we treat them is how we're treating Jesus. Now, let me give you some introductory verses. I'm going to give you five points tonight. But before I give you those points, I'd like to give you some introductory passages that we're going to read to kind of lay the foundation. Look at Proverbs chapter 14 and verse 31. Proverbs chapter 14. And look down, if you would, please, at verse number 31. Y'all still glad to be here tonight? Amen. Y'all glad to be online tonight? Say amen. All right. Proverbs 14 and verse number 31. Proverbs chapter 14, if you would please, in verse number 31, it says this. He that oppresseth the poor reproacheth, look what it says, his maker. But he that honoreth him, that's God, hath mercy on the poor. All right, so here's what God says. You look at a poor person. And if you oppress them, God says you're approaching that poor person's maker. You're not just mistreating a poor person. You're reproaching God. And then it says, if you want to honor God, here's how God says to do it. Have mercy on the poor. So don't, don't look. None of us should say, oh, I want to honor God with my life. And then we're disrespectful to poor people. We should never be disrespectful to poor people. We should never look down upon the homeless or the down and out, those in need. We should always, be, every poor person ought to be welcome in our church, in this, in this city. Every poor person ought to be welcome here. I don't care if they're homeless or not. I don't care what. We, we, we reproach their maker if we don't treat them well, if we oppress them. All right, let's look at another verse. Look at Proverbs 19 and verse 17. Proverbs 19. You know, we have such a bad tendency in our culture to treat people well that have a lot of money, you know, or that have a lot of stuff or have popularity. But then someone who doesn't have the 
opportunity to do something for us, then we just dismiss them. Or at worst, you know, we treat them poorly and are unkind to them. That's just not the good way to live. Look at Proverbs 19, verse 17. I love this. Man, I love this. It says this. He that hath pity upon the poor lendeth unto the Lord, and that which he hath given will he pay him again. All right? If you ever have the opportunity to help a poor person, you're making a personal loan to God. Because when you give money to a poor person, you are giving money to God. That's what it says right there. And God says, I'll give it back. I'm, I, and by the way, when he gives it back, you know, it's with interest. I mean, it's not like he just, you know, you give 10 bucks to a homeless person and then, you know, next week God gives you 10 bucks. No, it's, it's kind of like tenfold or sometimes even a hundredfold. There's a verse in the Bible, there's a, there's a, and I don't have time to show you it right now, where God will give back to someone a hundredfold what they give on his behalf. So when you give to, the, to a poor person, you're lending un, unto the Lord, and eventually, sometime in the future, he's going to pay you back again, but he's going to give you back so much more uh, than, than what you gave in the first place. Now, it doesn't mean every time you give $10, you're going to get 100 times that. What is that? Uh, ten, uh, $1,000. Uh, God's not saying that if you give someone $10, God's going to make sure you get 1000 But that's the possibility because it says it in the Bible. So as you give unto the Lord, I mean, under the poor, you are literally giving to God himself. And he is saying, I'm going to give it back to you. And again, more than what you gave in the first place. All right, let's look again. Mark chapter 9, verse number 36. Mark chapter number 9. And uh, verse number 36. Y'all still glad to be here tonight? Let's, let's, be, let's be happy in the Lord. Amen. Let's be happy in the Lord. We'll, we'll, we'll be done by uh, 8.15, so uh, we'll get you out of here. We're, we're committed to having an hour and 15-minute church services, the best we can at least, and, uh, and we'll just see what the Lord does during this, this time. All right, so look at Mark chapter 9, and look down at verse number 36 and 37. It says this, And he took a child and set him in the midst of them, and when he had taken him in his arms, he said unto them, Whosoever shall receive one of such children in my name, look what it says, receiveth me. And whosoever shall receive me, receiveth not me, but him that sent me. All right, so here's what Jesus said. Every child, now this child could be younger than the, what we call the age of accountability. It doesn't have to be a child that necessarily is saved. It's just any child. And God says, if you receive a little child in my name. Now, you remember what it means to, res to do anything in God's name? It's, you know, we, it's not that prayer that you pray, you know, Lord, help me pay my rent. In Jesus' name, I pray, amen. Um, no, you, it's not a tag that you put on the end of a prayer. In his name literally means for his honor, for his glory, and for his purpose. So if you receive a child in the name of Jesus for the honor of Jesus, for the glory of Jesus, or for the purpose of Jesus, then God says, you, Jesus says, you've received me. Now, every child. And that's why God is so upset when we mistreat children. He says it'd be better if a millstone were wrapped around your neck and cast into the depths of the sea than for you to offend a little child that believes in him. So God says, look, you treat children well. Don't you ever mistreat children. Don't abuse them. Don't, uh, don't, yell at them don't don't uh you know deflate their attitude and spirit to living for god i mean don't dismiss bus kids sunday school kids look w when we get sunday school going again I, I i wish i can convince every single sunday school teacher in our church that you're supposed to look at every child that's or teenager or even adult that's in your class as as if it was jesus in your class it would change everything it would change us as we studied and prepared. We wouldn't just like show up and just wing it and we wouldn't be careless and not, not you know, whatever. I mean, we'd be attentive and focused and passionate and we'd pray for them during the week. We'd visit them. Man, alive, visiting our Sunday school kids. I mean, we don't have Sunday school right now, but bus kids, all of that. As you treat even the littlest of children, how you treat them is how you're treating Jesus. And then what you don't do for him, of course, is what you're not doing for Jesus. All right, let's look at another verse. Look over, please, at, we were just in Mark 9. Look at Luke 9. 
Turn over to the Gospel of Luke, chapter 9, and verse 48. Luke, chapter 9, and verse number 48. Luke, I am your father. Oh, sorry about that. Here we go. Luke, chapter 9. <laughs> verse of, I haven't said that in a while. <laughs> Luke, chapter 9. I think some of you, every time I turn to the gospel of Luke, you're just waiting for me to say it. So I just had to, you know, some of you forgot about it. And so I just surprised you again. Luke chapter 9. Look down at verse number, number 48. All right. Luke 9 verse 48. It says, and said unto them, whosoever shall receive this child in my name receiveth me. And whosoever shall uh, receive me receiveth him that sent me. For he that is least among you all, the same shall be great. So you see, here's what we do. We tend, as a culture and a society, to look at people in their stature to determine if they're great or, or least important or unimportant. And here's what Jesus said. Look, if you, if you receive children in my name, you're receiving me. And by the way, those that in your eyes are least in heaven, they're the greatest. So you know what God says? If you had learned to start receiving those who are least now in this world, you'll, you'll be, <laughs> they're going to be greatest when, when, when y'all get to heaven. And so uh, we've got it kind of flipped around when it comes to our culture, but God says those that are least will be the greatest. And as you receive the least, you're receiving him. All right, look over at John chapter 13. Turn over to the Gospel of John. Again, we're just looking at some introductory verses before I give you the five main points tonight. John chapter 13, and look down at verse number 20. Now we're going to talk about preachers and messengers of God. Boy, this is big. I, I, I just don't understand people's lack of fear of God in our culture, in our society. People have no problem telling preachers off in society. I mean, they just have no respect for God and God's man. It's just amazing, you know, and uh, it's sad when it's in our church, but most of it is out there, you know, in the world. People just don't really, a lot of people just don't really care. But look at John 13 and verse 20. Look what it says. Verily, verily, I say unto you, he that receiveth, ready, whomsoever I send receiveth me. And he that receiveth me receiveth him that sent me. All right, so who are the ones that Jesus sends? Well, the Bible tells us about God sending prophets. You know, John the Baptist was the forerunner for Jesus. He says, I'm the voice of one crying in the wilderness. Prepare you the way of the Lord. He was the forerunner of Christ. And so that's kind of what a preacher is. A, a, a pastor, a missionary, an evangelist. He's God's messenger. And God has, look, God is the one that sent me to Longmont, Colorado to start Hope Hole Baptist Church. So God says right here, verily, verily, I send to you, he that receiveth whomsoever I send receiveth me. So God says the people that I have chosen to speak on my behalf, to be my messengers. Like, for example, soul winners. This also applies to soul winners. When I go out soul winning and talk to people about the Lord, if they receive me, they're receiving Jesus as far as that verse is concerned. If they you know, blow me off or cuss at me or say I'm not interested, it's nothing personal. It's not that they're not interested in me and blowing me off. They're doing that to him. So whoever God sends, messengers, soul winners, Preachers, missionaries, evangelists, when God sends people to us, we better treat them well. We better treat them well. Because God literally says, whomsoever I send, if you receive them, you receive me. That's a big deal. That's a huge deal. That's why me as a pastor, I don't play games with criticizing other pastors. I let God deal with them. I, I'm not their judge. I'm not getting up here on a Sunday morning or Sunday night or Wednesday night and up here just preaching about what I think is wrong with other pastors in town and calling them by name or calling pastors across America. There, there are some independent Baptist preachers, I guess they think they're God's watchdog. They got to they gotta say in their own pulpit what some other pastor in some other state's doing wrong. You know, and they, they feel like that's what, you know, God said, touch not mine anointed and do my prophets no harm. Now that includes those who are anointed. David was anointed of God. But he was not going to touch Saul, who was also anointed of God. Are you listening? So we got to be careful how we treat those whom God sends. Because as we treat them, that's how we're treating Jesus. Look at Acts chapter 26. 
verses 14 and 15. Acts chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. Acts chapter 26, and we're going to read verses 14 and 15. Acts chapter 26, verses uh, 14 and 15. Acts chapter 26, verses 14 and 15. Now watch this. And we were all fallen to the earth. I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying in the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. And I said, who art thou, Lord? And he said, I am Jesus, whom thou persecutest. Okay, so this is Saul of Tarsus before he became the apostle Paul. Now, Jesus said, why are you persecuting me, Saul? And, um, and he's like, what are you talking about? I'm not persecuting you. He says, yes, you are. I'm Jesus. He said, who are you, Lord? He goes, I'm Jesus, and you're persecuting me. Now, who was Paul persecuting, or Saul of Tarsus? Who was he persecuting? Christians. He was wrecking havoc with the church, persecuting Christians. And here's Jesus said, hey, man, what are you doing? Why are you, why are you doing this to me? And Paul said, what are you talking about, Lord? Who are you? He goes, I'm Jesus, and you're persecuting me. Now, Paul didn't literally go up to heaven and start throwing stones at Jesus, but he was part of throwing stones at Stephen. And he says, hey, bud, when you did that to Stephen, when you're hailing men and women into prison, when you're traveling to strange cities, making havoc of the church, that's how you're treating me. Can you imagine Paul the Apost uh, Saul of Tarsus when he realized what he was doing? Because he thought he was serving God the whole time he was persecuting the church and throwing Christians into jail. And then he meets Jesus and if, you know, after the resurrection, of course. And he's like, whoa. He's like, I got this all wrong? He said, yeah, bud, you're persecuting me. Can you imagine that? <laughs> the gulp that he would have taken. Y'all remember those old commercials, I should have had a V8? <laughs> I'm sure Saul, I should have had a V8. Oh, my soul, man. <laughs> Instead of persecuting the church. Uh, but but here's, what God, here's what Jesus said. If you persecute Christians or the church, you're persecuting me. That's why I've never understood Christians who ever sue a, a New Testament church. I've never understood that. We had a missionary one time, years ago, probably about 10 or 12 years ago, that we supported, and um, all of a sudden, he got all cattywampus with, with the, his sending church, and he, and he filed a lawsuit against him. We dropped him right away, I mean like a hot potato. He said, but I got, he said, but I got done wrong by the church and the pastor. Let God take care of it then. God can take care of it, you don't need to be God. The last thing I'm going to do is send our missionary money to support a missionary who's law suing or suing a local New Testament church. See, what if someone does something wrong here? Let God judge them. Don't you persecute Christians. Look, every once in a while, some, you know, every once in a while, good grief, 26 years, hundreds and thousands of people have left Hopewell Baptist Church over the years, 26 years. Many of them left our church critical and angry. God bless you. Many of them were mad and, and bitter. You know what they did? They started telling people, don't go to that church. <laughs> they started lying about me. You know, there, there was this one guy who used to be in our church. I sent him an email one time. I, I didn't think the email was bad at all. But he printed it. And he actually carried it around with him and would show it to people. Look at what that pastor sent me. He's a bad pastor. <laughs> That's whatever, man. I mean, there are people that have tried to hurt Hopewell Baptist Church. I Look. If you hurt this church, you're hurting Jesus. I've had church members and staff members over the 26 years that I've been pastoring here that left our church and tried to take people away from this church to their new church. Well, good grief, man. How dumb can you be, man? I mean, what in the world? Come on. What? You're trying to hurt Hopewell Baptist Church? I think if this is the greatest soul-winning church in this area. Why would you want to hurt this place? Oh, I'm mad at the pastor. I don't like a sermon he preached, or I don't like how he treated me, or blah, 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 whatever. I mean, okay, so now you're going to persecute Jesus over it. It's exactly what Saul of Tarsus did. And Jesus said, it's hard for thee to kick against the pricks. Don't do that. Look at 1 Corinthians 8, verse 12. 1 Corinthians chapter 8. 
1 Corinthians chapter 8. Most people don't understand ethics. You know, just simple good ethics. Good night. If I ever got cattywampus and left this church, the last thing I'd do is try to cause problems to this church. That's the last thing I'd do. What was that? I would be a problem, wouldn't it? <laughs> I don't want to leave, Miss Lori. Thank you. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verse 12. Are you there? 1 Corinthians 8. Are you listening? Verse 12. It's good to listen while the preacher's preaching. Verse 12. But when ye sin so against the brethren and wound their weak conscience, you sin against Christ. So you know what God says right here? Look at how you treat children, uh, the brethren in the church, especially the brand new ones, the weak brethren when you have a brand new christian or someone that's struggling in sin and you wound them god says right here you just sinned against christ i mean seriously how you treat fellow church well i'm gonna do this to them guess what you just sinned against christ period end of discussion that's what the bible says well they deserve it let god do it then he's the vengeance he's the he's the judge not you don't wound a weak Christian, someone who's either a brand new convert or someone who's not grown in the Lord or someone who's struggling in sin. Don't wound their weak conscience. God says if you do it, you sin against Christ. Let's look at one more verse, and then we'll give you the five points, all right? Number one, I'm sorry, uh, 1 John chapter 4. Turn to 1 John chapter number 4. This is good preaching tonight, by the way. God is good, amen? Woohoo! The Word of God is good. <laughs> as long as I preach the Word of God, it's good, good preaching. All right, First John chapter 4. Look at verse number 20 and 21. First John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. First John chapter 4, verses 20 and 21. The Bible says, if a man say, now watch this, I love God and hateth his brother, woo, God says, he is a liar. For he that loveth not his brother whom he hath seen, how can he love God whom he hath not seen? And this commandment have we from him, that he who loveth God love his brother also. You know what God says? Don't you dare tell me that you love me and you hate your brother. Now that brother is not just an earthly brother, that's your specifically he's talking about the church so your brother in christ he says don't you dare you don't love god if you hate god's children you do not love god oh how i love jesus man i hate that guy over there <laughs> wrong there's no love of jesus if you hate god's children period end of discussion this is some pretty straightforward teaching amen straightforward verses now let me give you five thoughts about how our attitude's supposed to be in this coronavirus time and what we should do. Every person we come in contact with, those in our neighborhood, those at work, those in our family, um, those who are struggling, fearful, afraid, I mean, just everybody. Number one, write this down. As a Christian, you ought to want to do something for God. As a Christian, you ought to want to do something for God. I worry about Christians who don't care about doing anything for God. Understand, say, preacher, how can I get to a point where I just want to do something for God? Here's, here's the best way I know how. Understand all that God did in order to save you from going to hell. Just think about that. Think about all that Jesus did in order to save you from going to hell. Doesn't that motivate you to want to do something for him? I've never understood Christians who get saved and refuse to get baptized for Jesus. Say, I'm scared. No, you're not. I'm sorry. At this church, we do private baptisms and public baptisms. Because in the Bible, you know, the Ethiopian eunuch got baptized right there by a river, no church service. Day of Pentecost, they were 3,000, about 3,000 people got saved and baptized all together, public baptism. Then Paul and Silas in the, in the Philippian jail and uh, led the jailer to the Lord after midnight. 
He woke up his, his wife and children, led all of them to the Lord. They all got baptized the same hour of the night. So there was a family baptism. So there was an individual private baptism. Then there was about 3,000 that all got baptized together publicly. And then there was a family baptism where the whole family got baptized together. But again, it wasn't a public service. In fact, it was the middle of the night while everybody else was sleeping. All of those are fine. And we make all of those available here at this church. Every once in a while, we got people come to our church and say, we want to get baptized as a family. Hey, great. That's what they did in Philippian Jailer and his family. Sometimes people are like, well, I'm kind of shy. Can I just get baptized after the service is over or, you know, um, on a day that we don't have church or whatever? Sure, yeah, let's do it. That's what they did in the Bible. And then there are those that get baptized in, in a church service, you know, like 3,000 people all got baptized together. Well, the fact of the matter is, can you imagine Jesus doing all that he did at Calvary, paying for all of your sins, uh, being buried for three days and three nights, rose again from the dead, having victory over hell, death, and um, the world and sin, and uh, the devil himself, and all that, just so he could save your soul from going to hell? And then we look at him and say, no, I don't think I want to get baptized for you. Eh, I'd rather not. Man, that's someone who just simply does not understand all that God did to save their soul from hell. Do you know why I go to church every time the doors are open? With the rare exception of when I, you know, rarely ever get sick, you know, just, I've missed one week of church plus one Sunday night service and, and uh, one Wednesday night service, and that, that was it. I mean, I, I think I've missed, in, in uh, 26 years, I've missed a total of uh, six church services in 26 years. But the fact of the matter is, is you know why I go all the time? Because it, I, I'm, I want to do something for Jesus. That's why I'm here. Number one, at least, the first reason, I'm doing this for him because he saved my soul from hell. If God, you know, I, 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 I faithfully tithe since I was 17 years of age. Why? Because I, Lord, this is the least I can do. You saved my soul from hell. If I can give you 100% of my paycheck every single week of my life, I would. I don't care about money. I'm not trying to get rich. I'm not trying to hoard it all for myself or even spend it all on myself. I mean, whatever I can do for Jesus, it's all because of gratitude from the fact that he saved me. Number one, as a Christian, you ought to want to do something for God. You ought to want to do something for God. All right, number two, write this down. What you do to others is what you are doing to God. What you do to others is what you are doing to God. Now watch this. Be very careful how you treat others because exactly how you treat them is exactly how you're treating Jesus. In this day and age of the coronavirus pandemic and you know all that's kind of going on right now, people are heightened with fear and they're like, you know, they're not treating everybody well, you know, and people are, you know, angry and all of this stuff. Better be careful. Better be careful how you treat them. Don't become like them. Become like Jesus. Treat them like Jesus would. Because how you treat others is exactly what you are doing to Jesus. When you serve others in a ministry of our church, you're serving Jesus. Do you realize, okay, today, when I went soul winning, and praise the Lord, I got to see someone saved over the telephone. I asked the person on the phone, and I said, has anybody ever showed you the verses how you can know for sure that you'll be in heaven one day and he said no i don't think so i said can i read them to you over the phone and he said yes i read them to him over the phone and uh got to pray with him and he got saved that's that you know i just did that to jesus how i treated that man is exactly how i treat jesus when you're a sunday school teacher or a bus worker or a nursery worker or an usher or a children's church worker or a youth worker or a reformers unanimous worker or someone that plays piano or plays the organ or sings uh in the choir or sings song specials i mean it doesn't matter if you pick people up and bring them to church and take people home it doesn't matter as you serve others is exactly how you're serving jesus christ and that's real important to understand you cannot say, Lord, I want to serve you without serving people. You can't. You just can't. All right? I said, number one, as a Christian, you ought to want to do something for God. We got about 10 minutes and we'll be done. Number two, what you do to others is what you are doing to God. Number three, when you do not help others or do not do good to others, you are not doing so to Jesus. 
That's point number three. When you do not help others or do not do good to others, you are not doing so to Jesus. Okay, listen. I just, you know, I, I, I'm, I'm a politician now, candidate. I'm a candidate. I haven't officially become a politician. I'm not sure if I even enjoy that title. I think I'm probably, if I do get elected, I, I think I'll just use the word representative and not politician because I don't want to be like politicians are. But anyway, um, as I've been running for office now for these 15 or 16 months, however long it's been, I have seen some of the dirtiest behavior from people. Haven't we all heard how politicians are corrupt and dirty and the whole business is, ah, well, man, I've experienced it first, first time. I mean, firsthand, I've experienced it. But I am determined that I'm going to do my very best to just be good to everybody while I'm running for office. And I'm telling people, look, we need a new kind of politician in, in our state, someone that just simply does, does good to people. You know, I, I, I've, uh, I remember <laughs> one time I was giving a speech up in Greeley uh, for a breakfast, and I said something nice about a politician. And uh, this is a particular politician that's kind of controversial, you know, someone that either everybody loves her or everybody hates her or whatever. But, you know, I just simply said something nice about her. I, I, I kind of bragged on her briefly. It wasn't like a long thing, but just, hey, I mean, that's it. I just was nice. And uh, people went, ooh, whoa, I can't believe, you know. And then, of course, you know, she reached out to me and said, boy, thank you. I heard you said something nice about me. Thank you so much. And, and we've kind of developed a little bit of a friendship, you know, that we're polite to each other and, you know, kind of praying for each other and all of that. So wouldn't it be great if all of us just kind of lived that way? I mean, I wish I, I, I hope I get elected. I hope enough people in House District 63 will elect me to represent them so I can start the process of changing how politics are in the state of Colorado. You know, there's this thought that if you're going to win a campaign, you've got to do all kinds of dirty hate mail and make up a bunch of lies about your opponent and just crucify your opponent publicly so that you'll win. That is just so, so wrong. I will never run a campaign to smear somebody as I run for office. I never will. Now, if someone tries to smear me, then I'll, I'll, I'll defend myself. I'll answer the, you know, the accusation. I'll try to make a point to tell people, don't listen to them. They're lying about me. But I, I'm not going to send out a mailer and just try to crucify or smear my opponent. I'm never going to do that. I, I just don't think we should be that way. We should always be good to people, especially those who aren't good to us. That's really what it means to be a Christian. If someone is unkind to you, it doesn't mean, hey, free license for me to be unkind back. I'll just be unkind back to them because they were unkind to me. No, just try to be good to everybody. What you do to others is what you are doing to God when you do not help others or do not, oh, by the way, um, oh, okay, so I'll defend people that are attacked. That's what Jesus would do. There, there was this w one politician that got attacked recently. And so I just went, I just said, hey, you bunch of stinking cotton picking corn pulling peach splitting idiots. What are you doing attacking this politician for? Don't you know that this politician's on the same team? They're not the enemy. The enemy is the ones that, that, that believe the exact opposite of what we're supposed to stand for. That's the enemy, not us, not on the same team. We're not supposed to attack each other. Boy, people came out of the woodwork to attack me on that one. <laughs> but I'll defend people because that's what Jesus would do, defending the attacked. Um, but at any rate, when you do not help others or do not do good to others, you're not doing so to Jesus. Number four, we're almost done because we only got five points. Now, this is the real kicker. Here we go. Number four, write this down. If, you, if you're going to get anything out of my sermon tonight, get this. Treat everyone exactly like you would treat Jesus. This is point number four. Treat everyone exactly like you would treat Jesus. Now watch this. This thought, this philosophy will literally change the way that you live. Think about this. Before you have any interaction with anybody in this world, friend, foe, family member, church member, unsaved person, whatever, Democrat, Republican, <laughs> <laughs> whatever man when you look at that person 
before you say a word or before you do any action toward that person. In your mind, say, all right, this person is Jesus Christ. In my mind, how would I want to treat Jesus? You say, no, they have to act like Jesus before I treat them like Jesus. Nowhere in the Bible does it say that. You know, sometimes children get all huffy and puffy about not obeying their parents, you know. Well, well, I, I would obey my parents if they were good. Well, the Bible doesn't say children obey your good parents in the Lord for this is right. It says children obey your parents, period, end of discussion for this is right. Well, if my parents are godly or Christian or good or right or tell the truth or whatever, then I'll obey them. No, 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 no. There's no verse in the Bible that says anything like that. Wives, submit to your husbands. Well, if my husband was good, I'd submit. No, 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 no. Wives, submit unto your husbands. Then it says, employees, obey your boss and treat them as you would treat the Lord. Well, if my boss was good, I'd... No, 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 no. No, treat your boss as if you were treating Jesus the same. When it comes to followers and leaders, when it comes to relationships in, in the Bible, God God always says, obey them that are above you, treat them with respect, submit to them, regardless of what kind of person they are. And God will bless you for it. There never is, I'll treat someone like they were Jesus if they started acting like Jesus. No, treat everybody exactly like you would treat Jesus. This will change your life if you'll embrace it. Number five and last. Listen to this carefully. Your inheritance in heaven or lack thereof in large part will be determined on how you treat others. Your inheritance in heaven or lack thereof in large part will be determined on how you treat others. Okay, let me give an example. We just read that passage in Matthew chapter 20. Uh, five that talked about the judgment of nations now watch this jesus all those nations are you listening to this not one of them was saved you see the rapture had already taken place and then all those who had died during the seven years of the wrath of god were already in heaven with jesus so jesus is coming back to earth right now with his saints and he's going to set up his kingdom to rule and reign for a thousand years you got that in your mind, that picture in your mind? So every person on planet Earth right now as he's coming back, they are all unsaved. Not one of them is saved. When he comes back, the judgment of nations is Jesus judging the heathen nations solely on the fact, how did you treat my people? And those that treated God's people well he let them come into the kingdom age by the way for the thousand years reign of Christ there's going to be all kinds of people getting saved for those thousand years they come from these nations of unsaved people that God allowed to come into the kingdom age then he looked at all those unsaved nations who treated his people poorly who sided with the antichrist says y'all just going straight to hell get out of here and they all just went straight to hell, those nations did. Now, what was it all, what was the determining factor? How they treated God's people. So you know what that means for you and I? When we get to heaven, our inheritance that we earned, or lack thereof, in large part, will be determined by how we treat other people especially how we treat God's people. Do you know why? Because how you treat people is how you treat Jesus. If you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. If you have not done it unto the least of these, you've not done it unto me. And so this is kind of a big deal. In this day and age of the coronavirus and all the pandemic and all the hoopla and the fear and everybody getting angry at those who step outside the door of their house to go to the park or to go to church or anything, let's just make sure that while all these people are not necessarily behaving very well, let's treat them well anyway. Let's do good to them because that's how we're treating Jesus.
And then everybody in our church, let's get along with everybody. Why would we have any division in our church? Every person in this church is someone that represents Jesus Christ. And how do you treat the brethren? Don't, don't, don't wound their weak conscience like God says. You do, you're sinning against Christ. Well, they ought to be more mature. Better be careful how you treat them. They ought to grown in the Lord. No, just don't, don't wound them. You do, you're sinning against Christ. It's clear. Don't persecute the church. Don't persecute Christians like Saul of Tarsus. Jesus said, you're persecuting me. What do you mean I'm persecuting you? I'm Jesus, and as you treat my children, you're treating me. This is a big, big deal. You have done it unto Jesus. Let's make sure that we do right and not wrong. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for allowing us to be here this evening.